to be able to get that stain out. In some instances, I, I know I, I told the story, I'll never forget it. As a kid growing up, there were about three times a year you could count on getting clothes. One of them was for Christmas, uh, one of them was for Easter, and the third was the start of school year. And one year, my mom made the tragic mistake, bought me some white tennis shoes. I don't know, I was kindergarten, first grade. White shoes, and first thing I did after uh, she bought me those shoes, I got them out of the box and put them on and got my Tonka truck and went down the hill, started rolling around in some dirt, some clay. It'd be good if kids do, would do more of that nowadays. Can you say amen? But I got those white shoes. Uh, I got that, that red Alabama clay on them. I went to shoes with, I went to school with shoes with stains on them. Some clay you just don't get out. And uh, but that's what the the writer was talking about. She picked me up out of the the miry clay, and the Lord began dealing with me on that. The thought came to my mind: Thank God, He's not afraid to get His hands dirty. Now you look at God throughout creation. He formed man out of the dust of the ground. That to form means as a potter would mold the clay. You know his hands had to be dirty when he got done forming Adam. He got done making Eve. But he looked at his creation. He said it was good. When sin entered into the equation, he had to pick David up out of a miry pit. Amen. Again, he wasn't afraid to get his hands dirty. When he reached down into my pit and picked me up. Amen. If he... If he was worried about, amen, the, the clay, if he was worried about the sin, he never would have reached down to get me. Amen, but thank God we serve a Savior that's not afraid to get his hands dirty. Amen, and able to reach down to where we are. Amen, and I am so thankful this morning for that. Amen, I want you to continue to be in prayer for Brother Eddie and Sister Kim as they are out on, on their vacation. The Lord will bless them, give them traveling mercies on the way home. Amen, but uh, we are appreciative for, for the church for allowing them time away and know that they're going to be refreshed and renewed in, in mind and body and in spirit. I want you to continue to remember all the prayers and the needs that we've been praying for. I also um, want to ask the church to pray. God gave us a, a kingdom connection this week. I've been uh, working with Brother uh, Daniel um, Morales in Cuba. He was the, the Church of God overseer in Santiago de Cuba for the um, entire island of Cuba. And uh, for a short spell, the United States had lifted some of the travel restri restrictions and some of the embargo. And uh, we were able to get down there and preach a meeting for him and his church and uh, able to get them some support that is needed. But all of those restrictions have gone back and have been placed on Cuba, and so now, us as Americans, we just can't send money to them or send goods uh, because of the embargo and because of the restrictions. But he and I have communicated back and forth, uh, really, since we uh, left down there. It's hard to believe, going on two years ago. But uh, as we were talking a couple of weeks ago, and uh, he was talking about the food shortage in Cuba right now, and he said that they are experiencing a food shortage that is as bad as it was in the 90s when the Soviet Union collapsed. And uh, Russia or the Soviet Union was a big provider of goods and food for Cuba. And uh, he said now it is just as bad as it was then. The price of goods have gone through the roof. If you can't even afford to, to buy food, the shelves are bare. Uh, there's not a whole lot um, that are that it is available to, to people. Rice is about the only thing that's there, and even rice is becoming uh, hard to, to come by. And he said daily, people are coming to the church and, and asking for, for food and for, for help and assistance, and so I was going to uh, send some down to help him, but I, I can't. I just can't send money. And he told me, uh, mentioned that uh, there's a pastor in Cuba that he worked, or excuse me, in Canada, that he works with and said you can go through them Canadians can send funds to us and I'm just leery of sending money to somebody I don't know and to somebody I don't trust and uh, I've, I've been burned too many times to fall back into that ploy and trap and uh, he gave me the number and said here's the pastor he said here's his wife you can call them and you can establish connections with them 
And uh, he said, they're very trustworthy. We've been working with them for years. So I called them on Thursday. And uh, just instantly, our spirits connected, very kindred spirits. And uh, we started talking about the church and talking about COVID and different things that's, that's going on. And we thought we have it bad here due to government restrictions and regulations. They have not been able to gather as a church for 15 months. 15 months they have not had a meeting together in their church. They are having to abide by guidelines. And I asked the question, I said, why don't you just break the rules? The, the good rebel American and patriot that I am, well, I just, just gather and have church. She said a church last Sunday in, in one of their um, towns not too far from them decided that they were going to defy the government orders and, uh, and, and have church. Somebody ratted them out to the authorities. The government official showed up. If you are found in violation of government standards on the spot, it is a $750 fine per person. In one church alone in Canada, they wrote over $800,000 in fines on one Sunday. So they're very strict. She said there's family in, the, in their church that, that are having COVID. People are, are sick. They can't visit them. They can't, um, you know, show up to pray with them. There's family, she said, that we've not been able to see in 15 months. And she began to tear up on the phone, and she said, would you please have your church to pray for us that God would uh, move, get this COVID uh, taken care of, get it out of the way, um, but to pray that we can be able to gather as a church family. My, my heart was broken because I remember the three weeks where we couldn't gather and how bad my heart ached to be able to get back and see my church people. Three weeks is a far cry from 15 months that they're having to endure and to go through. So be in prayer for them. It's the Lampman family, Peter and Judy Lampman in Ontario, Canada. And I told her that our church would be praying for them and um, she said that uh, they would be praying for us. Um, and I pray that the Lord would um, use this to, to further his kingdom. Only God knows what he's going to do. Who would have known all those years ago when Brother Eddie was meeting all of these people? Brother Reuben, Brother Hanks, different ones, expanding by boys, impact and influence across this world. I mean, all that God was going to do through us to further the kingdom of God. And I feel like this is just one more kingdom connection there. So you be in prayer with them, the Lampmans and their church. I believe it was uh, Waterford uh, Covenant Community Church, I believe was the name of it. I, I may be getting that wrong, but I told her that we would be in prayer for them. So remember them in your prayers uh, as we pray that the Lord would help them. She said, I'm praying for revival to break out in America and spread to Canada. I said, well, it wouldn't hurt my feelings a bit if it started in Canada and spread to America. I said, I just want revival to come. Amen. So we have a, a common desire to see God move and thank God for his people and uh, just praying for God to move there as well as here. Sister Michelle is going to be taking the children out for Children's Church. So if you would like to, um, or kids uh, can go ahead and go to Children's Church. Sister Paige is out this morning. Uh, we always appreciate what she does. And thank you, Sister Michelle, for uh, filling in this morning. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to turn with us to the book of John, chapter number 6. I'm going to read four verses of Scripture, verses 53 through 56 this morning. Again, let me say how good it is to have everyone in service with us. If you're visiting with us, just remove that visitor tag and allow the Lord to move in your life this morning. I believe he wants to. I believe he desires to. Amen. And I want to see him do great things this morning. John chapter number 6, verses 53 through 56. Then Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except ye eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, ye have no life in you. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is meat indeed, and my blood is drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me, and I in him. 
And I want to preach to you this morning, if the Lord will help me on this thought, the provisions of the blood of Jesus. The provisions of the blood of Jesus. If you will, stretch forth your hand one more time and ask God to help us and anoint us in this place. Father, we love you. We are so thankful for the privilege that we have once again to come and to gather in your name. Father, places on the planet, they can't experience what we are this morning under one building, under one roof with brothers and sisters of thy precious faith as we worship you and feel your presence. God, and feel your spirit. God, I thank you. I do not take it lightly. I do not take it for granted. But Lord, I do want us as a congregation to take advantage of the opportunity that has been given unto us. Lord, and to allow you to move in our hearts and in our lives. God, I pray right now for the preaching of the Word of God. Father, that you would anoint us as we endeavor to preach what you've laid upon our hearts. God, anoint us to say every word that you would have us to say. God, and with that same spirit of anointing, I pray that you would anoint us to not say one thing more. But God, let everything that's done, let everything that's said, let it be done unto the edification of the church and to the glory of God. Father, let everything that's done be done decently and in order. And God, I pray that you would touch hearts and lives even now. God, I pray that you begin a rest in the heart that I can't reach with conviction. And God, I pray that you would begin drawing God, in a way that only you can, do a work. God, I pray that somebody be saved, delivered, set free this morning by the blood of Jesus that we endeavor to preach about. And we'll be careful to give you the glory, the honor, and the praise in Jesus' name that we pray it. And the church says amen. amen. And amen. We're preaching this morning on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can promise you if there is one message that hell is doing absolutely everything that it can to censor, to silence, and to stop. It has messages on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's okay to preach about God in His various forms. Because God can be very generic. The Muslim has their God. The Hindu has their God. The Buddhist has their God. So it is quite common and quite popular to pray to people's gods and in the uh, on the capital when the sergeant at arms open up and opens up in prayer it's a very generic prayer praying to a god that can be interpreted multiple different ways but i can tell you it's something altogether different when you pray to god and you invoke the power of the name and the blood of his son the lord jesus christ the devil don't mind you pray in a generic prayer to a generic God. But it hair lives all of hell. When you preach in the name. Hallelujah. Of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you invoke the power of His blood. I can understand. Why governments try to censor. Messages on the blood. I can understand why. Different religions shy away. From the doctrine. And preaching on Christ and His blood. I totally understand. And get that. But what I do not understand is why many in the church have silenced this message. What I do not understand is why many in the church are scared and, and, and shy away from preaching about the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. In church growth seminars, it has been said that if you want to grow your church and you would like to uh, grow your congregation and be a, a large church with a large center of influence, uh, that there are some things that you can't do. You can't preach on sin. You can't preach that, uh, that Jesus in some instances is the only way. Uh, and in some instances they will tell you you can't preach uh, on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. People don't want uh, a bloody religion. Uh, well if we have to stop preaching on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ to grow uh, into a mega church. I don't want a mega church. And then if you've got to stop preaching the core tenets uh, and the doctrine upon which the church is founded and upon uh, the foundation on which all of the rest of the house is built, uh, it don't matter if you run 10,000. Uh, it's going to be 10,000 tares. Uh, then there's going to be no spiritual fruit uh, and no spiritual life there. Uh, we as a church and we uh, as preachers and we as Christians, uh, we must not shy away from preaching uh, on the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, when 
we quit preaching the blood, uh, we strip Christianity of all of its power. Uh, when we quit preaching the blood, uh, amen, we uh, uh, make Christianity powerless uh, and fruitless. Uh, the preaching of the blood is the foundation uh, on which the rest of the spiritual house is built. Uh, amen. We're starting on the ground level and the foundation this morning uh, that we must not shy away from, uh, that we must not bow down and compromise on. Uh, amen. We must preach, uh, amen, the provisions of the blood uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. We must arise and preach it louder than ever before. Jesus Himself said in John chapter number 6, he said, except you eat of the flesh of the Son of Man and drink His blood, you have no life in you. Now I know that it is impossible for me tonight, today, to eat of the flesh of Jesus and to drink His blood. There's no possible way for me to do that in the physical. I know what Catholicism teaches you. That when you take of communion, that that is a transliteration that takes place. That when you take of the cracker and the juice, they teach to you and their doctrine is that you, that, that actually turns into the body of Jesus. And that literally turns into the blood of Jesus. I can tell you, that is a farce. That's right. Physically, we are not eating of Jesus' flesh. And we are not drinking of His blood. But what Jesus was speaking here, amen, was not in physical pretenses. Amen. He's not saying that we must eat with our teeth and with our tongue of His body and drink of His flesh. Amen. Drink of His blood. But Adam Clark says this, unless ye be made partakers of the blessing about to be purchased by blood, passion, and violent death. Ye cannot be saved. He went on to say, As a man must eat bread and flesh in order to be nourished by them, so a man must receive the grace and the Spirit of Christ in order, amen, to be saved. As a food in a rich man's store does nothing to nourish the poor man that needs it unless it be given unto him, and he receives it into his stomach. So the whole foundation of mercy existing in the bosom of Christ and uncommunicated does not save a soul unless that soul partakes of Christ. Partakes of Christ. Physically, we're not eating the body and drinking the blood. But spiritually, you must be a partaker of the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. I can preach to you this morning about the blood all day long. But that blood will have no power in your life unless it is applied. Brother Eddie can preach about the blood of Jesus from now till Jesus comes. But if all this message is, is words. If all it is, is just words flowing from lips. And it's never received. And it's never applied. Then the blood of Jesus will have no power in your life to save. He will have no power in your life to deliver. He will have no power in your life to set free. For the power of the blood comes in its application. It comes as we partake of the blood of Jesus and we say thank you Lord uh, for what you did on Calvary. Uh, thank you for dying in my place. Uh, thank you for the finished work uh, and the substitutionary work of Calvary. Uh, thank you for shedding your blood for me. Uh, I receive of that blood. Uh, I partake of that blood. Uh, it is then that the blood uh, has power in your life. Uh, it is then uh, that the doctrine uh, of Christ becomes more than just words uh, but it becomes power uh, in your your life. Oh, we ought to lift up our hands and thank God this morning for the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Our Lord's meaning here, Adam Clark said, appears to be that unless we are made partakers of the grace of that atonement which He was about to make by His death, that they could not possibly be saved. I will agree very much with that statement. Man cannot be saved except they have an encounter with the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Cannot be saved. Will not be saved. Amen. The way to hell is paved with good men with good intentions. Sometimes the hardest men and women to win to the Lord Jesus Christ are good people. 
because they somehow think because they're good people, because they don't break the law, because they've never been to jail, they've never committed murder, they've never done anything uh, contrary to the laws of men, uh, that that equates to salvation. Uh, I can tell you that is not the case. Uh, hell this morning is full uh, of good men and good women uh, that never had an encounter with the blood. Uh, but I can tell you that heaven uh, is full of some of the worst crooks uh, and murderers and thieves uh, and vagabonds to ever live. Uh, amen. But when they had an encounter with the blood uh, of the Lord Jesus, Jesus Christ. Uh, he washed them clean uh, and made them whiter than snow. Uh, oh, hallelujah. And now they're enjoying the eternal pleasures uh, of the place called heaven. Uh, good intentions does not equal salvation. Uh, it is the blood uh, and the blood alone. Uh, it's the power uh, of the blood, uh, the wonder working power of the cross of Calvary uh, that will save a man's soul uh, and set him free. I've got to get into the provisions of the blood. But I want you to realize what Jesus was saying in John chapter number 6 was an absolute revolutionary message that transcended all of common culture of the day. And I can tell you fast forward 2,000 plus years, the gospel message today is still a revolutionary message that still transcends all of culture. You see, in the Old Testament covenant, when it comes to blood, I don't have time to go back and preach all of the, the precepts and the laws concerning blood. But the principle was established in the Old Covenant that was when sin was committed, that the innocent had to die for the guilty. Amen. That is why on the Day of Atonement, that is why on... Passover, that's why on other days that the priest would kill a lamb, a bullock, and he would uh, lay that bullock or that, or that ram, whatever it was, on the altar. The innocent was taking place of the guilty. And he would, I know that this is bloody, but he would slit the throat of that animal. And then on the day of atonement, the priest would take that blood and he would go into the mercy seat, into the holies of holies. And he would sprinkle that blood on the mercy seat. The Jews knew all about this. These people that Jesus was speaking to in John chapter number 6, they were not ignorant concerning the law. They were not ignorant concerning blood sacrifice. They were not ignorant concerning the laws uh, of sin. They knew what sin was. Uh, and they knew what they had to do to cover man's sin. They knew what had to be done. The innocent had to die for the guilty and literally take their place. Uh, and that blood that was shed be applied uh, as an atonement for uh, man's sin. Uh, but Jesus in John chapter number 6 is saying uh, that the blood uh, of that lamb, uh, that the blood of that bullock, uh, it cannot uh, atone uh, fully for man's sin. It can cover your sin, uh, but it cannot take away your sin. Oh, Hallelujah. For a thousand years, uh, you've been offering blood sacrifices and it just simply covers your sin. Uh, but Jesus came not to cover sin, uh, but to take away man's sin, uh, to redeem man from their sin. Uh, and Jesus is saying you can kill, uh, amen, a hundred million lambs uh, on an altar uh, and that will not redeem your soul, uh, but you must partake of me. Uh, you must partake of my blood. Uh, you must eat of my flesh. Uh, for in it uh, is the issue of life. Uh, in it is freedom. In it is liberty. What the lamb was on the altar and what that blood was on the mercy seat, that was just a foreshadowing of Christ. That was to come. And Christ was saying, I'm here. I am the sacrificial lamb that was slain before the foundations of the earth. Oh, in me is life. Partake of my blood. Eat of my flesh. And you can have liberty that you're looking for. Uh, oh, the answer is old. Uh, or the message is old, but the answer uh, is still the same. Jesus uh, is still the answer for the sin problem in the world. Uh, Jesus is still the answer uh, for lost man and lost humanity that's dying uh, and on their way to hell. Uh, Jesus is still the answer. Uh, you must uh, have an encounter uh, and partake of this blood.
revolutionary, contrary to culture. Oh, I can tell you it still is today. But you hear me, I'd rather be on God's side. I'd rather be on the side of Christ than I had this hell-filled culture any day of the week. Amen. When we receive of this blood, we know through Scripture that there are some provisions that provides the receiver of the blood. Number one, this blood provides redemption. This blood provides redemption. In the Word of God, redemption indicates the ideas of loosening from a bond, from setting free from captivity or slavery. It literally means to buy back something that was lost, stolen, or sold. It means to exchange something in one's possession for something possessed by another. It means... To ransom. When we look at those definitions of what the word redemption means, oftentimes we, we're going to preach on some of those words that we take for granted. Those that have been in church, like redemption, justification, purification. We use those words and sometimes we really don't stop to ponder on what those words really mean. But that word redemption has its roots too in the Old Covenant, in the Old Testament. For you can find in Leviticus chapter number 24, verses 24 and 25. It says, In, in all the land of your possession ye shall grant a redemption for the land. If thy brother be waxen poor and has sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin came to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. In biblical days, family land, a premium was placed on that land. And if someone fell into hard times and needed to sell that land, he had every right to sell it. But then if the next of kin or a kinsman redeemer found out about it, then under the law, there was provision in that for the next of kin or the kinsman redeemer to purchase that family land back that had been given away. He had every right to go back to him and say, this is what he sold it for. This is my family's name. This is my family's heritage. I'm going to, uh, I'm, I'm going to buy that back. And I am going to redeem that land. Amen. We see the parallel here. Amen. The most valuable thing that, that the world has ever received is a relationship with God the Father. It far supersedes land at the beach, yeah. land at the mountains, land on Lake Tahoe or in the, the, the Smoky Mountains. It's far more valuable than Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates' money combined and put together. But a relationship with God far supersedes all of that. But our forefather Adam gave that away. Our forefather Adam traded a relationship with God for a curiosity of wondering what the forbidden fruit tasted like. When he and Eve partook of what God told them to stay away from, immediately that relationship with God was severed. And uh, that relationship with God became strained. In the garden, Adam sold that relationship in return uh, for pleasure. Uh, because of that, Adam became a slave to sin. And not only Adam was a slave to sin, but all of the human race were made sinners by him. We can find that in Romans 5 verse 12. Wherefore is one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. And so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. That was the punishment for what our forefather did. Adam, he sinned. He severed that relationship with God. And because of that, you and I have had to deal. And every man that have ever, has ever lived since Adam has had to deal with the aspect of sin. But I want you to notice what Adam gave away in the garden 
Jesus Christ began redeeming in the garden. Oh, hallelujah. It was in the Garden of Eden that Adam plunged all of man into a degenerate, sinful state. But it was in the Garden of Gethsemane that as Jesus Christ began to pray, the Bible says that his sweat began to sweat as if it were great drops of blood. The first redemptive act of God, of Christ, amen, didn't happen on the cross of Calvary, but it happened in a garden as his blood began to flow. And that blood that flowed in the garden was just as holy as that blood that began to flow on the cross. Amen. What's the significance of that? What Adam gave away in the garden, Jesus Christ began redeeming in the garden. What Adam sold out and moved away from, Jesus said, I've come to bring man back to harmony that was in the garden. I've come to redeem man and to buy it back. I know Adam gave away. I know by his sin that all have been made sinners. But by my life, all men can experience this life, the life of Christ. Oh, and it was what happened in the garden. And subsequently what happened on the cross, Jesus Christ bought back what Adam threw away. Jesus Christ redeemed and restored the fellowship between man and the Father. I may not be able to go back to the garden, amen, and have what Adam had in the beginning. No, amen, but I can have what Adam had right now. Fellowship in Christ. Fellowship in the Father. Why? Because we have been redeemed by the precious blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. The innocent uh, died for the guilty. Uh, all the pure uh, died for the one uh, that had been lost in sin. Uh, and because of that work, uh, we can know the redeeming power of Christ. The provisions of the blood. The blood redeems man from sin. With one drop of that royal blood. Men's redemption was purchased. Christ paid the price to redeem man from their sin. The world, the Bible says, is a slave to sin. Yes. Yes. Slave to sin. Yes. And I can tell you the devil is a terrible taskmaster. Oh, yes, he is. oh your life will forever be cursed and crushed by the stinging aspect of sin. Yes. But I can tell you, beloved, that does not have to be your fate. I can tell you, beloved, that does not have to be your life story. Jesus Christ, some 2,000 years ago, paid your ransom. Amen. Purchased your salvation. Paid the price. So that you can be free. And your life can be redeemed. I feel the Holy Ghost this morning. Jesus Christ paid the ultimate price. On the cross of Calvary. So that you don't have to know the pain and aspects of sin. So that you don't have to die and go to a devil's hell. So you don't have to live your life unransomed and unredeemed. Let me tell you something this morning. The price for our salvation has already been paid. You can't buy it with a million bucks. You can't buy it with a billion bucks. Amen. If you could put a premium on the blood of Jesus, it would cost you much more than that. But it was the sacrificial act of Christ on the cross of Calvary when He said, It is finished. And he gave up the ghost. Amen. The redeeming aspect of man was finished. Hallelujah. He set, amen, the ransom money down to redeem man's soul. You can know freedom this morning in Christ because of the redeeming aspects of Christ. That is a wonderful provision of the blood. I'm sweating, I'm hollering, and I'm spitting this morning. But the fact of the matter is, I'm doing it in vain. And Jesus died in vain unless you accept His blood. Unless you accept it. Unless He washes you and unless He cleanses you. You will never know what it means to be redeemed unless you have an encounter with the blood of Jesus. You'll never know what it means to be set free. 
until the blood of Jesus is applied to your heart and to your life. Listen, I can give you the keys to a 2021 Camaro. But those keys do you absolutely no good unless you put it in the ignition. Unless you turn it over. Unless you put it in reverse or drive or whatever and put your put the pedal to the metal and begin to drive. Listen, the keys do you no good until they are applied. I can tell you the preaching of the blood of Jesus has no power in your life until the blood of Jesus is applied. Oh, but when the blood of Jesus is applied, oh, it unlocks, amen, the provisions of the wonderful blood to where you can be redeemed the same way that a slave would be auctioned off at the slave block and will be traded from person to taskmaster to taskmaster to taskmaster. That's what society is doing today, going from drugs to alcohol to fornication to adultery, amen, to gambling, to all kind of vices. Is all you're doing is being traded uh, from one taskmaster to the next, uh, and your life uh, is going to end in shambles. Uh, amen. But somewhere on that journey, uh, there must be an encounter with the blood of Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. He's already paid the price, uh, the debt has already been settled. Uh, you don't have to look anywhere else, uh, you don't have to turn to anybody else. Uh, the answer uh, is in the provision uh, of the blood. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The provision of the blood. First is redemption, which means to be uh, to be purchased. He purchased us. This morning, my life is not my own. It's been purchased by the Lord. I wouldn't go sign a note on a two hundred thousand dollar house if I did not intend to take ownership. And residence in that house. Me signing the note and paying the bills would be absolutely no good. Amen. If I did not abide and occupy that place of residence. That is exactly what Christ did for us on the cross of Calvary. He purchased this house. Now it's his desire to fill that house. Oh, that his spirit can take up residency in that house. Amen. All we are, uh, amen, is an empty possibility, uh, an empty vessel that God desires to fill uh, and to use. Uh, amen. That is what the redeeming quality of the blood means. Uh, he purchased me. Uh, I'm not my own. Uh, I have been bought with a price. Uh, I have been purchased uh, by the blood of Jesus. Yes, Lord. Not only does He provide redemption, there's no way I can preach all of this. Come back tonight for part two. The blood provides purification. Oh, hallelujah. The Word of God, James 4, verse 8, Draw nigh to God and He will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. James 4 and 8 puts a premium on purity. A premium on purity for that vessel to not only be redeemed but for that vessel to be pure yes. Yes. so here's the question how does a sinner that's been redeemed that's been purchased how is he to be purified he can't purify himself I can't purify him you can't purify him. But yet the Word of God places that same premium on purity. What's the answer? I can tell you the answer is in the blood. Brother Eddie preached this many years ago and I, 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 I've given him credit. Preached a wonderful message on the efficacious power of the blood. But in your blood right now, unbeknownst to you, your blood, as it's pumping through your veins, is constantly and continually purifying your body. Amen. Right now, there's all type. As you're bringing in, you're breathing in pathogens, allergens, all kind of things. 
that is detrimental to the health of your body. It's just a fact. You can walk in town and you are exposed to only God knows what. In this air, we thank God for a beautiful, clean sanctuary. But there's stuff that's airborne that we have absolutely no control over. And I hate to tell you, even in your own home, your name may be on the note every month. But there's things and pathogens and allergens that take to take a residence in that house that you can't see, that you don't know about, but they're there. The blood, some of the working of the blood is to continually purify your body. With every heartbeat that's pushing blood through your body, your blood acts as a filter to where things that go contrary to the body and the thing that uh, is contrary Amen. To the health and well-being of that body, the blood is the first line of defense to filter those things out uh, of your body. Uh, I won't get into the scientific explanation of how it happens. Uh, amen. Uh, th there's a lot of things there that you can preach. Uh, amen. That's powerful. Uh, but the, the blood is the first line of defense uh, against impurities in the body. Uh, I can tell you in the spiritual uh, how much more powerful the blood uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ is. Uh, the first thing, uh, the first filter uh, to come against and become between the child of God that has been redeemed uh, and purchased uh, and the sin that's floating around in the world uh, it's nothing more than the shed blood uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, the same blood that redeemed man uh, is the same blood that will purify man uh, and wash that man uh, and make him clean. Uh, there's not a 12 step program you can take uh, that'll clean you up honey. Uh, there's not a program out there uh, that you can go through that guarantees 100% success rate. Uh, but I can I feel the Holy Ghost uh, just one encounter uh, with this blood. Uh, hallelujah. There is no sin uh, that he can't purify. Uh, there is no addiction uh, that he cannot lose. Uh, there is no vice in this world uh, that he cannot set free from. Uh, the same blood uh, that redeems man uh, is the same blood uh, that will purify that man uh, and make that man clean. Hallelujah. 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 According to Strong's, the word purify means to clean, to purge, to announce cleansing. I can tell you, water don't purify a man. I got one, come on. Water don't purify a man. You can baptize a pig, and he's still a pig. I ain't getting too many amens right there. Maybe we need to preach a little circle. The doctrine of salvation. Amen. You can baptize a crook and he's still going to be a crook. Salvation is not in the water. Salvation is not in the H2O. That's supposed to take place after salvation as a work that we should do as a sign. An outward sign of an inward cleansing. But I can tell you, unless that heart is pure, then that water is in vain. Oh, hallelujah. There's a thousand people in Gulf Shores, Alabama, plunging in the beach this morning. They're drunk. They're high on dope, on all kind of things in this world. They'll go into the water. They'll come out in the same sinful condition that they were in. Amen. They may take a shower or bath every night. They go in a crook and they come out a crook. The power and salvation is not in the water, but the power of salvation is in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are redeemed by that blood. We are purified by that blood. Oh, hallelujah. I am not the man that I used to be. Why? I've been purified and made clean, not with the blood of bulls and goats and lambs, but by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. There is purity in Him. There is purity in His blood. There's power in His blood. That is a provision and the wonderful work and power of the blood of Christ. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, 
Hallelujah. There's nothing too dark. I didn't talk to her and tell her what to sing this morning. The Holy Ghost lines this thing up. There's nothing too dirty that He cannot make worthy. Oh, hallelujah. He's washed me in mercy and I am clean. You feel? How many of you know what I'm talking about? Sometimes you just go in some places and you come out feeling dirty. There's sometimes by the product of your environment that you're in, you just feel dirty. In the physical and in the spiritual. Sometimes you just feel like, man, feel dirty, yucky. There's times in the spiritual. Somebody in this house knows what I'm talking about this morning. You just feel dirty. Hallelujah. You've gone through the help. I've seen where you've been. I know where you are. And I know you by name this morning, saith God. The power that you're seeking after does not come from man, does not come from flesh, but the power to purify your life comes from the blood of my son. He gave his life and shed His life so that you not only could have life, but you could have that life more abundantly. Don't reject this morning the provisions of my Son's blood, but run to Him. Apply that blood to your heart and to your life, and you can know freedom. Who I have made free, saith God, is free indeed. Run this morning unto me. Claim the blood of my son. And this power will be a reality in your life. To redeem your soul unto me. To purify your heart. Your mind and your soul. And I shall make you clean. Lift your hands and love him this morning. Stand with me all over the building. I'm done. I'm through. Hallelujah. Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The provisions of the blood of Jesus. The provisions of the blood. He's come to redeem you this morning. Set you free. The Holy Ghost. Spoken through His Word. Spoken through His Spirit. Yes, Lord. Amen. This morning there's somebody here that needs to be redeemed. Your life is in chaos, your life is in ruins, your life is in shambles. But the answer has been given to you through the preached Word and by the Word of His Spirit. He's come to redeem you and to make you whole. Amen. You're here and you need to be purified. You need to be cleansed this morning. The same blood that redeems you is the same blood that will purify you. Oh, hallelujah. The provisions of the blood the provisions of the blood. He's come for you this morning. You might have got up this morning. You really didn't even want to come. But there was something on the inside of you drawing you. I can tell you this. Amen. Is what the Spirit of God was drawing you to. This is what the Spirit of God was drawing you toward. Don't run this morning away from Him. But run to Him. If you're here and you need to be saved, run to this altar right now. The church is coming. We're going to pray. Amen. If all would find their way into this altar, you need to be saved. Come, find a place to pray in this altar. Amen. You need the cleansing work of Calvary to take root in your life. Amen. Come to this altar. The answer is in the altar. The answer is in the altar. The answer is in His blood.